Um, I am Rachel Rose. I have been using our amazing oils for about nine years. And so this is my, actually my probably eighth or ninth year teaching this class. And we love to teach this class around Christmas. Um, it's kind of tends to be with the time of year that we do it. Although you can use these oils all year long. Um, I know a lot of people on my team, they will save up their loyalty rewards points. They'll stockpile them up and then they'll get this kit. Um, I'm not sure if you knew you could do that, but that's a really awesome thing to do. And I know last year we took all the oils in this kit and I added a couple drops to um, of each oil to roller bottles, like really pretty gold roller bottles and gave them as gifts. So we are gonna go ahead and launch right in. Um, and tonight we're gonna to be covering the oils of the Bible. I'm trying to turn my phone down, sorry. The ancient oils of the Bible. And I'm going to reference an amazing book. So um, I will try my best to do justice to these oils the same way that this book um, has. This book is called Oils and Scripture, A Modern Perspective on Ancient Tools by Aaron Rodgers. Not sure if someone could drop that into the chat with the link, um, but it is a great book. It goes into um, extensive detail of how to use the oils in this kit, the background, which I think is probably the most interesting part, um, the history. And so when I first learned about these oils, yes, it's great to learn about modern name uses, but also hearing how they used them back in biblical times gave great perspective. Um, I think a lot of people think that these are very new age, but mind you guys, these have been around for hundreds, if not thousands of years. There she is. Hey, Ash. Um, so we will go ahead and launch kind of into the introduction of how long they've been around, who used them. And I will go ahead and kind of start. I mean, God, obviously he planted the first garden, right? And so if you think about essential oils that come from plants, and come from, I mean, what is the best garden? Garden of Eden. Um, so basically with creation, he has given us tools to naturally help heal, restore, and protect our bodies and by way of essential oils. Um, I love to use the oils before I pray, before I meditate. Uh, we'll talk extensively about this, particularly with frankincense. Frankincense, as we all know, is very oxygenating for the brain. So it really helps to calm me and center me when I am going into prayer and, and sitting down to read my Bible. That's one of my favorites. I also like to diffuse it, and I'll also diffuse that with cedar wood. So when you think about or hear about frankincense in that context, next time you do pray or sit down to read your Bible, I strongly encourage you to use that. Um, Ashley, did you want to go ahead and start... Um, telling us about how far back the oils go, some of the, um, not books, but the scrolls that we can find them in, and we can talk a little bit about the background of the people that use them. Sure. Welcome, everybody. I'm so excited you're here. I hope you have with you, um, you can have your Bible or the Bible app on your phone is great, or just the internet to Google the verses that we'll talk about. And then any of the oils, I listed them and email us and out to a lot of people today and in um, several of our groups, but the oils we'll be using, there's several of them that are outside this kit that if you have on hand, I think will be really helpful for you as we dive into this content. And there are a few different resources. Um, really, this content is based on an amazing script that Rachel wrote from Oils and Scripture uh, book. There's also an amazing book called Healing Oils of the Bible from Dr. David Stewart. And then there's some resources inside this kit, which is Oils of the Ancient Scripture. And I was thinking, how funny is it? There's Oils in Scripture, Oils of the Ancient Scripture, Healing Oils of the Bible. They all are really referencing the same thing with Young Living. I had some questions about that today because people were like, I don't know if I have them or I don't know who they are. I'm like we just kind of use them interchangeably depending on your faith and really where you're coming from is how you're going to view these oils, right? Like how you'll view their historical content and then in references and then how you'll view the modern day application. So please use the chat function as we go along to ask questions. We have several of us in here that will be monitoring that as we take turns teaching and we would love for you to engage and ask questions there. So something that is really important 
to note is that we have to watch out for um, in this space, we have to watch out for the gift being twisted for people using it for their own purpose. And what that means is sometimes our oils are used in ways that are against the scriptures and they are founded and rooted in the scriptures. So that might not be where you base your life, but that is where the oils come from. And they're not based in things that go against against the word and go against the scriptures so just because they are using them in that way it doesn't make the actual gift of the oils wrong it might make the twist wrong and the way that people are seeking truth in different areas so that is an area that i like to speak into because sometimes it can get very confusing especially if you're someone who is new to oils so just briefly to mention, oils are the lifeblood of the plant. They are designed to heal, restore, and protect the plant. They do the same in our bodies, and they were used in biblical times as God's provision for us. Part of his provision is still today, and I've visited multiple farms. I know Rachel has, Tracy have, it tries Tracy has, and we know that these are the only brand of essential oils we're comfortable using on our family, especially with our children, because they are pure and that we have, you know, complete faith in the promise that they are beyond the organic process and really important for us to be united in understanding we're talking in living oils only tonight. You can use them topically. You can use them um, with direct inhalation. That would be from a diffuser or from um, just inhaling from the bottle. And that topical application can be with a carrier oil, a fatty oil, or using it neat, which means directly on the skin. And the third way is ingesting. So our oils are completely safe to ingest. And you won't talk about, we won't talk about that much in this class, but our entire line of oils can be ingested. Um, and oils and history in scripture. So Rachel just referenced different scrolls they were referenced in and different historical documents. One of the oldest known medical records supports this called the Ebers Papyrus. This is an Egyptian document dating back to 1550 BC and it's from the Israelites in Egypt. So I always think it's really interesting to think about the historical reference of this. The Israelites lived for a long time as prisoners in Egypt and we believe they learned a ton there. They were able to take their knowledge across the wilderness for 40 years and into the promised land, into God's promise for them. So in the Ebers Papyrus, we have 700 recipes and protocols using plants for therapy. They were used in um, the embalmment of bodies, perfume, all tons of different healthcare references in there. And if you just listen in on this class tonight, you'll learn that healthcare in many different oh, I don't know how to say it, cultures, Rachel, it really involved priests, it involved the church, and it involved a lot different than we would say with healthcare now. We're talking like a doctor and a pharmacy and health coverage and deductibles. Like it, it wasn't like that at all. It definitely was the community coming together for healing and for wholeness. Pharaohs were buried during that time period with vats, like literal vats of oils. And this was to show... Um, their cultural importance and their wealth. And they were to take the oils with them into the afterlife to use them because that was a belief during that time period. So distillation, that's a, such a big question. People are like, okay, Ashley, they use the oils in 1550, but how do they get them? So steam distillation was used by the Babylonians, the Chinese, the East Indians, the Egyptians, and the Sumerians. They were distilling back as far back as 3,500 BC. And this technology started to disappear in about 1000 BC and it was gone by the fall of Rome in 500 AD. Um, really sad to think about because just the way we lived was very different. And we really started having more of a, let's call it a pre-industrial revolution, revolution, right? Pre as in like a few thousand years earlier. But this is when we had new techniques for cultivating food, for um designing crops and they disappeared and the Parisians actually rediscovered this technique and it was thousands of years later. Uh, things had greatly improved when we think about modern distillation. We have the ability to adjust a knob. They were using campfires. Um, the amazing tools of thousands of years ago, they are still in place, but with our modern technology, they're much better. And depending on your translation of the word oil. It's found directly in the Bible 191 times and over 600 references to essential oils um, more in a generalized context. So essential oils are referred to as fragrances, ointments, odors, perfumes, or even sweet savors. And it's called perfume in scripture because it was a legit oil product. It wasn't manufactured synthetically. Um, it didn't have additives and all the things we do to recreate that now. 
then it was 100% pure and from the plant and was beneficial, not just on a smell good level, but beneficial on a healing and wholeness level to the wearer. Oils are mentioned in scripture with little of no indication of day-to-day -day use. And because they are in the Bible and it is a series of letters, poems, and writings inspired by God, you're not going to hear that everyday cadence of how normal people would talk. And what's really funny for me is I think about if I was writing a letter to Rachel or an email or text, I probably would say, Ethan had a fever. It's been pretty crazy. Um, we've done all the things and I'm wondering if you have suggestions, right? I might say that. What I wouldn't say is Rachel last night, Ethan had a fever of 105.6, 1.6 higher than the level he can go to school. And I decided last night to try peppermint on his spine and his belly button and some copaib. I use some frankincense too. And I use a little myrrh. I actually did a wet sock treatment and I went through and did a detox bath. Then I gave him some ninja with a drop of myrrh in it. And then after that, I actually went over and I decided to try some Tylenol. The dosage on the back of the bottle of Tylenol said for every four to six hours, I could give him an additional teaspoon, but I went ahead and did a half a teaspoon. And after that half a tea, I would never say all that. Because I know that our language, we wouldn't have to tell someone um, in this circle, maybe how to use peppermint. We wouldn't have to tell someone in the normal everyday life, they would read the Tylenol bottle, right? So think a little bit about how in scripture, the reason there's not direct protocols for how they use them, and we have to read between the lines a little more, is because it was an everyday thing for them. And when we dig into scripture or more into understanding of scripture, the Lord will speak to our hearts and the Lord will speak to us and he will give us his wisdom on how to use these amazing gifts that he's given us through all of his creation for health and healing and wholeness in our bodies even today. It's very important to know that culturally these were accepted and oils and ornaments were used and it was widely accepted. It wasn't controversial. It wasn't a different way. It wasn't the natural way. It was the way. So speaking to chemistry, in the past 30 to 40 years, modern distillation has been an awesome merging of science and art and learning how our ancient friends use these plants for healing. And we can thank our founder for bringing the modern approach to distillation. He is the world leader in essential oils. Even after his death, he continues to lead out front with his research. His teaching, his knowledge cannot be compared. And we're grateful for the contributions to science that he's made. And starting actually in the early 90s, so over 30 years ago, scientists were able to isolate compounds and essential oils to help them better understand how they impacted our bodies. So, of course, with that science advancement um, was the desire to create cheaper alternatives to these precious oils. And that's really scary because if God made it, God did it best. Creation can't be replaced in a lab. It can't be duplicated. It cannot be replicated in any way. We love scientists and we love science, but I'm sorry, it's absolutely not the same. So thankful science has come around to try and understand the oils, but there's never a reason to try and copy them. One drop of essential oil contains 40 million trillion molecules. Our bodies contain about 100 trillion cells. So any single drop of essential oil can cover literally every cell in our body with tens of thousands of life-given molecules. Just breathing in our oils can have a huge impact on our health over time, especially when we use it consistently. And in that same realm of learning about oils and how they're used, I love to learn more about how aroma works in our brains with our memory recall, how smell evokes very live memories and aroma can take us back to a memory in an instant. And this story of the sweet, sweet power of aroma gets me every time. It just brings me so many emotions to think about what it must have been like to experience this ritual. In ancient times, foot washing was a sign of a welcome into a home. So there was a bowl of water. You'd walk in, you'd wash your feet because all that freaking red dirt around and clay and nastiness on those ancient streets, you wouldn't want to track through a hostess's home. Or you wouldn't want to track through just the home of anyone um, that you were visiting for dinner, maybe a friend you were just stopping by, all kinds of casual and formal, ga formal, ga formal gatherings. There was always a basin with water and you would wash your feet. Then after you washed your feet, you'd actually dry your feet off and then guess what you would do? You'd apply a really special blend of oils, of essential oils, 
to your feet to create a sweet aroma and cleanse your feet and anoint your feet, get them ready for the meal ahead or for the friendships ahead or for the conversation ahead, whatever it may be that night. So this is a pretty neat thing to think about because the oil was used as a guest for a guest to remind them of being welcome into their happy home. Just like an aroma might take you back to a childhood memory. It's pretty neat to think about when they would walk into a home, they would smell that they would know that their feet were going to be covered in it. And that's the smell they would automatically smell and remember their friends. Remember that special night. So beyond recalling memory, countless studies have shown that inhaling oils can have a huge impact on brain functionality. Emotions can heal our brain. Also, oils can affect our emotions. That's the power of diffusing. When we inhale oil directly in through our um, through our nose and through our, really when we go all the way up, <clears throat> sorry guys, I am having a moment and it's not a senior moment because I'm not 40 quite yet, but when we have or olfactory, there we go, or olfactory bulb. And then we actually have it go about in our brain and, and decide where in our body it's going to affect. It affects everywhere in our body, even as it curves out or carves out new neural pathways in our brain, it's going to send signals to different parts of our body that are going to be forever impacted. And we're going to clean off those areas that might just have gunk and it might be emotional gunk, physical gunk. It might even be things that we didn't know that toxins are affecting different parts of our bodies that those those oils go in and clear out and really help us with emotional stability. So when we look in our scriptures and we see what healing was in the body, we see many examples. We often think it has an instantaneous, miraculous healing. That's how Jesus healed. That's how God heals. And that's like when someone says, my knee hurts, pray for my knee. And you like lay hands on their knee and their knee, honestly, you know, they don't need surgery anymore. They're healed. The tendons, ligaments, the whole joint is just restructured. It's amazing. And guys, that does happen. That is the power of our God, but that is not the healing that the Israelites would view as true healing. In fact, the very first healers among the people were the priests. And while they, there were doctors in large part, you would first go to the priests and the doctors were kind of an afterthought. And in this world, the Lord would link our physical, emotional, and spiritual healing together. And that's our hope still today. So it's only in our modern culture that we have a place where we go for emotional healing and for physical healing and for spiritual healing. So we have like our counselor, our church and our physician, right? But that's not how God truly designed those things. He designed them to be in tune with each other and to work together. Biblical priests had many jobs. Um, they led worship, um, offering sacrifices and prayers. They served as spiritual counselors and heard confessions. They were judges who enforced the ecclesiastical law. They were keepers of the perpetual fire that burned day and night to honor God at all times. They were apothecaries and perfumers. They mixed various oils and herbs for anointing and for incense and for healing. They were responsible for the grounds around the temple and the maintenance of those grounds and the temple structure itself. Overall, they served as models of exemplary and righteous living. We have underestimated the role of a priest or a pastor or an elder or a deacon or just a disciple or as a follower of the Lord. We've underestimated these roles. While Exodus provides instructions to priests who served the Israelites, the New Testament provides a very different story. How many of you guys on here tonight, and please know that all are welcome, all faith backgrounds, all belief systems, all people who are here tonight, but I would love to know how many of you guys view yourself right now as like, you know, the new Testament, you believe in that, that is your view of healing. Anybody just think it's interesting. Yeah. A couple of you guys. So in first Peter two, nine, but you are a chosen people, a Royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into wonderful light. We are the priests of today. We are the priests right now in this role that was created thousands of years ago. What does that even mean? Second Corinthians 6, 16 says to us, for we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. We are the temple. 
the spirit of God resides in our very being. Let's just have a moment. We lead worship. We pray. We serve as spiritual counselors. We enforce ecclesiastical law. We are the keepers of the fire that burns for God in our own heart. We are in charge of mixing oils and herbs for anointing and for incense and for healing. We are responsible for maintaining the grounds around the temple of the living God, which is in our hearts and the temple of the beautiful places that we go and worship the physical places. Overall, all of us are models for righteous and exemplary living. We are priests. We are. That is our role. And that's what we are called to do and who we're called to be. So in English, we say healed. In Greek, there are three words for heal. There is sozo healing. This is used um, over a hundred times. It's also often translated as salvation or deliverance out of danger into safety. This also speaks to total restoration of body, soul, and spirit. So we think John 3, 16, um, but to save the world for, from sin. So if you open up your Bible, because I think it's it's kind of fun if you have one with you. I would love, can somebody read for us John 3.16? What's the verse a lot of us know? Anybody? This one now. Uh, Margie Taylor Green will join Liz Willis. Uh, no. Yeah. Somebody yeah. unmuted. I thought you might want to, but I'll go ahead and do it. Just wanted to ask. I think it's always a good offer. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. And there's so many different translations, but God to love the world gave his only son that whoever believes will not perish, but have everlasting life. That is powerful because that is the healing we're talking about with Sozo. Ayumai is used 27 times in scripture, and it refers to supernatural healing that only Jesus can do through touch and words. If you go to Matthew chapter 15, verse 28, but really in this whole chapter, we hear the story of a Canaanite woman who begs for mercy on her demon-possessed daughter. In verse 28, Jesus says to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted and your daughter was healed. I am I. And the moment. So Matthew 15, 28. Anybody have that pulled up? Matthew... I know none of y'all want to read the Bible verses for me, but I'm just trying here. I have it actually. Perfect. Let's do it. All right. Matthew 15, 28 says, then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. Thank you. Amber, that was awesome. Because here's the thing. The story behind the story or the story before the story is really simple that we know the gospel was written for Emily for Jews, but it was also for Gentiles, which is what she was. And through the confession of faith and the works that Jesus has already done for us, we can both receive the verse as healing, no matter who we are. And it might sound simple, but I want you to think about how big that is for us as modern day healers and also as looking at the healing. So looking at the healing would be that we are able to do the healing. I am I, this happens not very often, but we're able to do the healing because of who we've cre been created to be. And this is super fun too. Therapeuo is used 40 times in scripture. And this is means reversing a physical condition to restore a person having an illness, disease, or infirmity. And I love this analysis. This is from the book by Dr. David Stewart that I held up earlier from the Healing Oils of the Bible in Mark 6, 13, where Jesus instructs his disciples to anoint the sick with oil and heal them. The healing word is therapeutic. And Luke 13, where Jesus gives instructions to 70 others to heal the sick, the word is therapeutic. In Revelation 22, 2, where it says, the leaves of the tree shall be for the healing of the nations. The word again, therapeutic. God does not ask that we do miracles, I am I. He only asks that we care for the sick, therapeutic. And we find that by applying his natural medicines and using the healing in front of us, we are able to um, claim what's ours. That's this type of healing as any 
believers in his natural medicines and in him. So Jesus' ministry was to care for the sick and broken, and we're able to join him and be a part of what he did on earth. So some are broken in body, others are broken in spirit, and we have these tools at our disposal to heal, restore, protect, and most of all, help. So let's talk anointing. Anointing means to cover them with an ointment, to cover, rub, or smear the head or body with oil. In some cases, it means to pour oil over the head or over the body. What I think is fun is I would love from a show of hands in here, how many of you guys have ever been somewhere where someone's been anointed? No. Tracy, you've never been to one of our classes in person. Man, you need to come like, like in two weeks. Yeah, some of you guys. So I grew up and I didn't think much of it, but I grew up in a church environment where anointing was like really like, I had seen it a few times, but it was just someone using a little bit of olive oil on someone's head. They, it was just a little, like a little, like a little dab, dab, dabby, dab of oil or someone's like, I'm anointing your house. And it was kind of just like, a little, it was very neat and very calculated. And that's great. Please don't think that that experience should be judged in your brain. I'm not trying to make it that way in mind. That's just what I thought of as anointing. It was a very neat like process. When someone said they were anointed, I also felt like that was like a neat, like they're called to do it. And so note these things. James 5, 14. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with the same oil in the name of the Lord. Psalm 23, 5. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Psalm 133, 2. It is like the precious oil poured on the head, running down the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down the collar of his robe. Note, it says precious oil. That precious oil wouldn't have been olive oil. That was not an oil that was a great that was not of great value to them then. It was just like we use it now it was for cooking. Anointing oils serve many purposes. They were performed during a sacred time or to consecrate someone for a sacred use. Um, this for them would extend even like you wouldn't just anoint the president of a nation. You anoint someone because they had a new job or someone maybe because they were a new mother or someone maybe maybe because they got married or someone because they became a believer. Um, for them, for the, those times it was in God, right? Not in Jesus. And it was done after that hospitality, that foot washing the home, then they would anoint the feet. It was also done for medicinal purposes. So if someone was sick, you would anoint them with that healing balm, with that oil, with that ointment. And then bodies of the dead were sometimes anointed. Um, this was meant more for royalty. And the woman who discovered Jesus had been raised from the dead arrived at the team at the tomb to anoint his body with these spices and ointments. So physical healing involves four things. And this is where I get so happy that we have Zoom, but also so incredibly sad that I can not anoint, that I don't get to anoint one of you as part of this class. So we do four things when we anoint someone and I don't have a pre-made anointing oil here. Usually that is my dear friend Rachel's job and she's so good at it. And she always brings me a pretty little bottle and I make a giant mess. But what I wanna show you, is if I was doing this and I just had an essential oil and I didn't have a carrier oil, I couldn't make the holy anointing oil from Exodus, but I just had this oil. What I want to do is I want to do it biblically sound. I want to do it the way that it was intended to be done. So it says the pouring on of oil. I'm literally saying like, this is the head of someone. I'm pouring it. Like my hand is their head. You understand? Pouring. Not so it gets in their hair. I mean, in their eyes, but maybe in the back of their head that I'm going to lay hands on their head. If I'm anointing their shoulders, I can do that too. Pour on, lay hands on them. And as I lay hands on them, I'm then going to pray over them to speak into their spirit, to use words that God has for me in that moment. And then I'm going to open my eyes because the fourth part of the biblical process of anointing is a blessing. So that would simply go, you know, it'd be very simple. If someone was taking a new role. Maybe it was, they were being a mother for the first time and I wanted to anoint them like in their new role. Then let's say Rachel, I would pour some oil on her head. I'd put my hands on her head, put the oil through her hair. And I would just pray that God has an abundance for you in this next step of motherhood, God, of just blessings. Um, 
he has so much to offer you as you go out into the world and speak his word and truth as a mother, as an influencer, as a raiser of a world changer. So stopping because whatever it goes on to that prayer. And then I would look into her eyes and the blessing would be Rachel, you are the mother of a great nation. This baby is going to change the world and you will forever make an impact on generations to come because of your decision in this moment to raise up this mighty principle, your son, or whatever it is. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the Lord was very precise in how he instructed us to give um, this, this, these four steps and anointing. And there's a very specific recipe in Exodus 30, 22 through 31. That is on page 18. Rachel, do you mind? Would you mind reading them that excerpt? The holy anointing oil. Then the Lord said to Moses, take the following fine spices, 500 shekels of liquid myrrh, half as much, uh, that is 250 shekels of fragrant cinnamon, 250 shekels of fragrant calamus, 500 shekels of cassia, all according to the sanctuary shekel, and the hen of olive oil. Make these into a sacred anointing oil, a fragrant blend, the work of a perfumer. It will be the sacred anointing oil. Then use it to anoint the tent of meeting, the Ark of the Covenant law, the table and all its articles, the lampstand and its accessories, the altar of incense, the altar of burnt offering and all its utensils, and the basin with its stand. You shall consecrate them so they will be most holy, and whatever touches them will be holy. Anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them so they may serve me as priests. Say to the Israelites, this is to be my sacred anointing oil for the generations to come. Do not pour it on anyone else's body and do not make any other oil using the same formula. It is sacred and you are to consider it sacred. Whoever makes perfume like it and puts it on anyone other than a priest must be cut off from their people. It's pretty beautiful, you guys. And we get the privilege now of a really important part of our class is we're going to go through the oils of the Bible kit and how they would have been used in ancient scripture, and then how we can use them today. What I want you to still hold tight for is some of them we won't have a ton of information, and some of them we will. Some of them you may have smelled, and some of them you may not ever smell unless you get this kit, but please know that God intended each of these oils for healing, for wholeness, and I cannot wait for you more about them. So we're going to go through them with you um, if you have them with you, open them up, smell them. I'll be doing the same. So let's go ahead and Rachel's going to kick us off with myrrh. Okay. So the first one is myrrh. Many of you may have this. You may not. This is one, honestly, like I, as a mom of four little kids, I would highly recommend having this one on hand. And I'll tell you why in a second. It is a very thick oil. And so over time, you'll find that it like just gets super gunky. And so my piece of advice would be, to on Amazon, they have these little droppers for like five mil bottles um, and you can get the dropper and just take the fitment out, put the dropper in. So when you need it in a moment's notice, you're not sitting there waiting for it to come out. It literally drew it like oozes out. You can just get your dropper and do however many drops you want. So this is a thick oil and it actually comes from a resin similar to, to frankincense. And so resin is, it's, it can turn hard and then you distill it into an oil. Um, it is really high in a chemical, a naturally occurring chemical constituent called sesquiterpenes, which is essentially brain food. So it's really oxygenating for the brain. Um, you can use it in any oils uh, for focus. I know I've added it to focus blends before. Historically, it was used for perfume um, or medicine, oral health. So often in earlier times, they would walk around and they would chew on the resin. Like this is, it's funny when I read more into this, this is actually a very common practice is chewing on the resin. And that was amazing for oral health. It was an ingredient in healing salves for abrasions and other skin ailments. So if you're making a boo-boo spray or what not, let's say you don't have any lavender, you don't have any other things. Myrrh is a great alternative. It's something great to add to any of your healing salves for your skin. It was great for bruises, sprains, and aches. They would use it for that as well. 
They would, as a gum for indigestion, ulcers, colds, coughs, asthma, lung congestion, and arthritis pain. That's interesting. It would have also been used for circulatory problems and uterine health. You guys, this is like, this was their modern day lavender. <laughs> I think of myrrh. And they would have had access to it. I mean, this was very abundant in that time in their region, and it still is in that region. Um, beauty treatments and skin conditions. If you do not have myrrh in your face serum, add myrrh to your face serum. This is fantastic for skin. Sun protection and insect repellent. I have yet to add this to my insect repellent, but there's an idea. It's the most commonly referenced aromatic oil in the Bible. It has first to be mentioned in Genesis 37, 25, and the last in Revelation 18, 13. It was also an ingredient in the holy anointing oil that we just read, and it was part of a six-month beautification process that Esther, remember Esther, when she was waiting for her king for six months, she had to go through these beautification processes including like with her skin and tons of myrrh was used. Um, many references to myrrh as a perfume, an incense, and an ointment all throughout the Bible. It was a gift to Jesus at his birth and also was used at his death. So I, the significance of myrrh, like in his life to me is so beautiful because it was brought as a gift at his birth and it was one of the last things offered to him um, when he was hanging on the cross. It was, it's, I'll, we'll read you that story in a minute. And it was also part of the burial preparations for Christ's body. So it's just woven, like, is that a word? Wove, wove all throughout kind of his life. Um, so every time I use it, I just think that's so cool. Um, one of the things with myrrh, I'll tell you, as just a mom going through birth and postpartum, I used it in my um, stretch mark serum or my stretch mark balm that I made through pregnancy since it's so amazing for skin. I also used it on my baby's umbilical cord as it was falling off. And with my last three babies, it fell off way quicker. And there was, it was like beautiful. I can't, it wasn't crusty. Like it was just, it was just beautiful. <laughs> but someone told me that and I just thought, oh my gosh. So Mary would have known that. And she would have also worn it as a perfume and like the wise men knew that. This was just something traditional that was such an honor to pass on in a gift. Okay, that's myrrh. Second one is cassia. You guys, if you don't have this one, if you like cinnamon, you're gonna love cassia. And the thing about cassia, especially in the diffuser, you really don't need much. I only add like one drop to my diffuser blends and it you people walk into my house and they're like, what is that? It is very potent. Um, so it will go a really long way. It is a hot oil because it's in the cinnamon family. But this is, it refers to the bark from an evergreen tree originating in Southern China. Again, very similar to cinnamon, but it's actually, like I said, quite a bit hotter than cinnamon. Think how far cassia had to travel to get to the Middle East. So this was an expensive oil during that time. Just getting it over to that part of the world um, was expensive. Ezekiel 27, 19 lists it as a trading commodity along with wine. It was known as the oil of gladness for its emotional uplifting effects. So I love to diffuse cassia with citrus oils, especially grapefruit and orange. And we all know that citrus oils, even with, with research and everything, are proven to be uplifting to the brain. So when you pair those together, it's just really amazing going in your house. So um, right now I've just been diffusing cassia, orange, and Northern Lights black spruce. I love that combo. Also historically, it was connected to improving blood circulation, supporting the immune system, as well as the digestive system. It was part of the holy anointing oil from Exodus that we just named. And it was, again, widely used and available during biblical times. Um, I'll just read quickly Psalm 45, seven through eight. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. Cassia again is known as the oil of joy. All your robes are fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia from palaces adorned with ivory. The music of the strings make you glad. Okay, so that's cassia. Again, right now, my favorite is way to use cassia is 
to diffuse. But I gave you some other hints of how else you could use it. The third oil is Annika. Um, I will let Ashley, please chime in on these if you have <laughs> uses for them as well. Um, but Annika, again, is a gum resin. Are you guys seeing a theme here? There's a lot of resin, myrrh, frankincense, Annika. It was used by ancient Egyptians in the art of perfumery and incense. It was also mentioned in the holy incense in Exodus 30. Historically, it was used for dental health care. They would chew on the resin. It was a primary ingredient in tinctures for small injuries used as disinfectant, a local anesthetic, and to speed the healing of wounds. This is another one that you could add. You can make a spray. Sometimes with my kids, I'll do a healing spray to spray their boo-boos, or you could do like a balm um, to apply to boo-boos, and that's another way that you could use the Annika. As part of the holy incense, the fragrance of Annika would have perfumed the entire sanctuary. Did you have anything else to add for Annika, Ashley, or should I move on to assist us? Oh, you can move along. It's okay. pretty, it smells, I, I, I want to caution you. If you're nervous about these, I would, this kit is a great one to get with your loyalty rewards points. Loyalty um, rewards. You can get it with that. It's also a great one just to have and to make some rollers for yourself and your family. Um, I know this is a random time to say that, but I just feel like when we teach this class, sometimes people feel like it's so far removed from their everyday life, but I promise you, you'll find ways to use them. And then you'll be like missing, like me, I'm like missing random gold bottles from my kit because I've used them all. So really dive in. And even if you're not sure how to use it after we talk tonight, I promise you'll find a way. But get this book. It goes into depth of how you can use it. And then also the other resources, the pocket reference will go into depth of how you can use it. Um, the next oil is Cystus, also known as Rosa Sharon. It has a honey-like scent, but it's different than the thorny rose we're more familiar with in modern times. Historically, resin from cystus was used as an ingredient for incense, and it was used medicinally to treat colds, coughs, menstrual problems, and rheumatism. I love this, y'all. I'm going to read. I, I, I love this little story of how shepherds use it. So shepherds commonly used it on the skin of goats to promote healing when injured and also for their sheep. So listen to hear how they used it for sheep. Sheep can get their head caught in briars and die trying to get untangled. There are horrid little flies that like to torment sheep by laying eggs in their nostrils, which turn into worms and drive the sheep to beat their head against a rock, sometimes to death. Their ears and eyes are also susceptible to tormenting insects. So the shepherd anoints their whole head with oil. Then there is peace. That oil forms a barrier of protection against the evil that destroys, tries to destroy the sheep. So the shepherd would use this oil literally for their ears, their nostrils, for any, like all the pests, all, all the things. And it serves as a, a barrier, a protection. It helps to calm the sheep. And they would also use this to treat any gashes on the sheep from getting caught in briars. Do you have times of mental torment? Do the worries and thoughts invade your mind over and over? Do you beat your head against the wall trying to stop them? Have you ever asked God to anoint your head with oil? Um, so I just love that. I mean, I don't know how many of you have ever just like poured oils on your head when you're stressed and said a little prayer, but I think that's a great nod to that as well. Um, okay, so that is Cystus. Ashley, don't you have a story about Cystus in your armpit? Is this the oil you used on your armpit? Yeah, girl, me and Jenny Ogle and Tasha, we got all kinds of stories. <laughs> With Cystus, if you ever have a funk up or underneath your funky areas, whatever that funky area is, for mine, it was my armpit. I just had such a weird, like a boil. I don't even know how to describe it, y'all. It was nasty. And cystus and a hot, hard boiled egg. Those solved the world for me. And I did just say what you think I said. Cystus multiple times a day. And literally, everybody says, heat something up, make a hot, hard boiled egg. Hard boiled an egg while it's hot as crap and you feel like it's going to make your armpit or crotch or leg or whatever you're using it for on fire. Take the hot, hard boiled egg. Okay, seriously. So cystus, hot, hard boiled egg. But cystus will clear skin infections with a quickness. Um, I've known the reason I mentioned other areas, 
is I've had a girl on our team have, and I'm sorry that I don't have a name for these things, but like I didn't go to the doctor, so I don't know what the boil was from. It was just disgusting and it hurt. And that's what made it go away after I used skin creams um, as a natural ones. But I had a friend's doctor give me like a natural skin cream she used. And I tried to put on their tea tree and all this junk. And it was cystus and hot, hard boiled egg. Okay. But I had a friend have a boil that she thought was like something really serious um, in her like bikini line area. So it wasn't ingrown hair, but she didn't know what it was. And it was funky, funky. And she just used cystus like every day, four or five times a day, gone. Booyah. There you go. Are you sure you want me to talk? Because that sounds no, really I weird. mean, this is what we need to know how to use it. Isn't it? Yeah. Is it good for bleeding? Is that the one I'm thinking of? It's it's not good for, it's not oil that clots, but it's a oil that can be used to stop. Okay. Um, yep. Got it. Okay. Next one is cedarwood. Um, I believe many of you have used cedarwood. This is one of the first ones that when people get the starter kit, I suggest they try outside of their starter kit. It's a great oil for focus. This one's also really high in sesquiterpenes, essentially brain food. It's believed to be the very first essential oil ever distilled. Its history and medicinal and practical uses traces back to the Egyptians and Sumerians, who used cedar wood in their embalming processes over 5,000 years ago. They also used this oil for medicinal purposes and the timber to build their dwelling. So back then, um, temples, their instruments, coffins, boats were made from cedar. Um, so you can just imagine that smell. I mean, have you guys ever been in a cedar closet? Just that smell everywhere. High in sesquiterpenes, again, super oxygenating to the brain, helpful with focus. It also helps with sleep because it enhances melatonin, melatonin stimulation in the brain. So pairing cedarwood with lavender next to your bed diffusing or next to your kids' beds diffusing, you can make a roller, apply it to the bottoms of your feet as well. Um, king Solomon's temple was built from cedarwood. So 1 Kings 6, 11 through 15, the word of the Lord came to Solomon, as for this temple you are building, if you follow my decrees, observe my laws and keep all my commands and bathe them, I will fulfill through you the promise I gave to David, your father, and I will live among the Israelites and will not abandon my people, Israel. So Solomon built the temple and completed it. He lined its interior walls with cedar boards, paneling them from the floor of the temple to the ceiling and covered the floor of the temple with planks of cypress. Um, the oil in, a, in cedar or like a cedar closet stays aromatic for years and they some even say centuries like even like these original structures the things that have been found there's the aroma in the cedar is still present um but I just love that that was one of the first ones to still cypress so cypress trees were commonplace in biblical times they again used as a building material for large temples and structures as well so cedar wood and cypress were the two big ones in biblical times, cypress trees were planted in Mediterranean cemeteries, symbolizing that life after death had become, begun. Cypress trees are still commonly seen at cemeteries around the world now. I thought that was cool. Emotionally, cypress supports feelings of security and stability, so it was perfect for the floors of the temple. Have you guys ever thought of cypress as an emotional oil? I have not. So after teaching this class for the past several years, I started adding cypress to like my calming blends, or I'll add them to the diffuser. Um, any tree oil is going to be incredibly grounding. I typically resort to like black spruce or frankincense, but cypress is a tree oil as well. And sometimes I forget that because when I think of cypress, I think of like helpful with circulation. And again, it was also used back, back in the day for circulation as well. Um, Historically known for supporting the immune and cardiovascular systems, and our ancient friends would have used it for arthritis, laryngitis, scar tissue, and cramps. There are records dating back to 1800 BC mentioning cypress oil. Um, okay. Ashley, chime in if you have other things to say about any of these oils. Myrtle. So I love myrtle, and I will just tell you, Myrtle is one, and I'll give you like my use before I, then I'll go into the biblical use, but Myrtle is a really great respiratory oil, and it's a very, um, it's an excellent oil for infants. So sometimes eucalyptus can be a little too harsh for infants, but Myrtle is one of the ones that I would diffuse and apply topically diluted to my babies. 
And I felt very comfortable doing that in respiratory distress. That is for sure one that you're going to want to grab if you have little kids or if you know someone with little kids or even you, Myrtle is a great oil for respiratory. It has a really bright and refreshing scent. So I also like it in the diffuser. Um, it's a flowering evergreen bush historically used um, in religious ceremonies. Our ancient friends would have loved to know it's incredible supportive of their endocrine system, your thyroid. So myrtle is also in our Endoflex blend, um, which is what we apply, one of our favorite oils for thyroid. Myrtle is great for that as well. So applying that over your thyroid daily is going to be helpful. And it's very soothing again to the respiratory system. Myrtle shows up in the book of Esther. In Hebrew, the word for myrtle is the feminine form of Hadassah. Hadassah is actually Esther's Jewish name. And we talked about this in preparation for Xerxes um, in Esther 2.12. Before a young woman's turn came to go into King Xerxes, she had to complete 12 months of beauty treatments prescribed for the women, six months with oil of myrrh, and six with perfumes and cosmetics. Myrtle was part of that as well. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> That's crazy. Um, Ashley, did you have anything to say about Myrtle or should we keep going? Just think about the name Myrtle, guys. Think about it a little bit. Not being funny, but like Esther, her name was Myrtle. And this oil, I feel like, is underrated, just like the name Myrtle. Like it just is. I love the name Myrtle. So it can turn into something beautiful. I didn't say it was bad, but Rachel, when we think about historically speaking, the name Myrtle was not like a sexy name. We're not like, hey, Myrtle. So if your name's Myrtle on here, I'm sorry. We love you. We think your name is smoking hot, but just in general, it speaks to how God can reveal things to us that are gifts that we don't know, just like this oil and the way you can use it on your body. The next one's frankincense. I mean, gosh, who does not love frankincense? It's like my favorite oil. Uh, it's distilled also from a hard resin. So what they do is they score the tree. So they like slice the tree and the tree bleeds this like white resin and it's a liquid. They collect it and they cure it in caves and it, um, that change in temperature causes it to turn into a hard resin and then they distill it into an oil. The process is really neat. It's an extremely grounding oil. Again, all of the tree oils, if you're, if you're feeling like you need to be grounded, tree oils, just always remember that. Dump them on you, diffuse them. I mean, I'm like, I just, I'm, I'm very drawn to tree oils and I feel like that's why, because I'm just like a lot of the time. So frankincense is a favorite for that. In ancient times, it was reserved for royalty. And anyone outside of royalty could be put to death if they had frankincense in their possession. So that's one of the reasons why the wise men bringing Jesus frankincense was them acknowledging him as royalty. I don't know how many people, I didn't really ever know that. I'm like, oh, that was just so commonplace. No, it wasn't commonplace. It was reserved for royalty. So the fact that they brought him frankincense, that was them acknowledging him as royalty. Um, they actually risked their lives bringing him that oil. Had they been caught with frankincense, they could have been put to death. Crazy. It was used in beauty rituals, and we all know that. And again, if you don't have frankincense in your skin serum, oh my gosh, literally, I've had quite a few people that I'm like, just, if you don't know anything about essential oils, or you don't even, just start using frankincense on your skin every day, on your face. Like, the, it just speaks for itself. I know Tracy has great testimonials with that. It was used throughout scripture and prayer and meditation, again, anointing with frankincense but frankincense is great if you're when you're sitting down for quiet time with your bible or to pray or just kind of to center yourself frankincense has the sesquiterpenes it's very oxygenating to the brain so it's going to help calm and center your brain and quiet the thoughts so i like to deeply i put it in my hands and i deeply inhale so you just kind of create like a call it a scent tent and you deeply inhale guys i'm not talking about you deeply inhale through your nose and you hold it and you breathe out through your mouth. And you can do that for like a good 30 seconds to a minute. And I'm gonna tell you, it like just, it completely calms your brain. You could also apply it to your temples. Um, so yes, applying it to your temples is great. Hyssop, 
Hyssop is an interesting smelling oil. It's also a thick oil. It's a brightly colored shrub that resembles lavender in some ways, though the blooms can also be blue, pink, or white. Both hyssop and lavender are from the mint family. Did you know that? Historically, leaves of hyssop were used to make a strong tea to help with nose, throat, and lung affliction. The oil was also applied to bruises. I'll just tell you when um, I've had lung stuff or some things that I couldn't kick or like some mucus, I will, um, I will dilute hyssop and put it over my lungs and on my upper back and I'll put it on the lung Vitaflex points on the bottoms of my feet. Um, so that's a great reason to have hyssop. <clears throat> um, in scripture, we find the primary use of hyssop was for ritual cleansing and ceremonial offerings. So in Leviticus, we hear instructions for a ritual cleansing of lepers involving cedar wood and hyssop. Um, and they also used hyssop branches a lot. So the Israelites, when they struck the doors of, uh, was it, it was the Israelites when they painted the doors red with the blood to skip over, you know, when Pharaoh was not letting them go. And so the firstborn son would die. They struck the branches, um, struck the doorways with lamb's blood using hyssop branches. They also used hyssop branches to offer Jesus a drink. I think they put some sort of sponge on the end of it with a vinegar and wine on the hyssop branch. And um, I'm sorry, I just want to make sure I'm doing this justice to read this. Okay, I'm just going to read you real quickly about Christ's crucifixion and hyssop. And guys, we're almost done. I think we only have like two more oils, so I'll be done in a second. Uh, but I love this story. That's why I was like stuttering. So I was like, did I skip the story? Because I loved, I loved this. Um, later knowing that everything had now been, been finished. So this is Jesus on the cross. And so that scripture would be fulfilled. Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there. So they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. She goes into detail talking about how um, hyssop, being when, when hyssop is opened, how it, she talked about like crucifixion and actually what it does to your body and how the lungs are like one of the last organs that are affected and how just even having hyssop around, it provided some sort of relief and comfort, um, just that aroma. It was really beautiful. You'll have to get this book to kind of read further into that. Okay, the last couple oils, aloes and sandalwood. Sandalwood is the most valuable tree in the world. Guys, there's a lot of tree oils. <laughs> tree oils and resins. The central part of the tree, the heartwood, is used in the distillation process to create the oil. I know Ashley and Tracy have been to the sandalwood farm in Hawaii, so I'm sure they have lots of great tips with this oil. The oil quality from a sandalwood tree is best in an older tree near the end of its life. Historically used for meditation and embalming, it was common for pharaohs to be buried with alabaster jars of perfumes in sandalwood. If you guys ever look at Mary Young's skin, if you ever see her in person up close, her skin legit, I'm like, are you 40 or are you 30? Like, are you 20? And she swears by sandalwood. Like she uses sandalwood on her face, diluted, I'm sure adding to her moisturizers, but that is like her secret to her skin. So that's a really big one to add to your face serums as well. It's also high in sesquiterpenes and oxygenating for the brain. So it helps with clear thinking and focus. And most commonly today, it's used for skincare, um, which again, you should add to your skincare. Okay, Ashley, did you have anything else you wanted to add regarding that? And then you can wrap us up. Sure, so I'd love to know in the comments, what is one thing you've learned from all of these different oils? I know you've learned a lot from the class in general, but I want to know what are you going to do with the information you've learned? So maybe not just the oils, but how are you going to live out as an everyday priest? How are you going to use sandalwood? What are you going to do next with this information? I would love for you to tell us. So this beautiful kit is great to have on hand, has many different uses. And the best way to get it is with your loyalty rewards order every month and making sure you're wrapping that up 
um, before the holidays, because having this kit out, I can't tell you how many conversations I've had from just having this out at a holiday ornament exchange or at Thanksgiving dinner, just having this kit out to just have a discussion sparked, to talk about the Bible and talk about oils and talk about things you love and how to use them. So thank you, Rachel, for so much great content tonight. I appreciate your wisdom and the script that you've gathered and just your ability to share from your heart how we can use these oils now and honor God in the way that designed he designed our bodies for them to be used. So thank you everyone for taking time tonight. We hope that you tell us all your testimonies of after you snag the kit and want to just, can I pray everybody before we leave? Is that okay? Just real quick. Awesome. Father God, thank you so much for the women who have gathered tonight to learn more about the role you created. Um, in our bodies for plants, God, and for healing, God, and how you've made us healers, God, that you've prepared us to be women who are stepping out into this world, to be mighty princess world changers, God, that are healing from the inside out using things you've given us, God. Have us remember who we are and whose we are and how to use the power that we already have that has been part of our DNA even before we were born, God, and to not shrink back from culture, but to step out and be bold, God, and step into your word and the roles you've called us to, Lord. Thank you um, again for every woman in attendance. Ask for hedge protection around each of their health and um, this holiday season around their schedules, God, and the families that are represented here tonight. May they be blessed beyond measure. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, guys, for coming. We appreciate you so much. And we'll have this recording for you soon. It's been a wonderful evening.